Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to a new week of study. And um, we're going to continue where we left off in Judges chapter 9. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are grateful once again to be able to come together, um, even though not in person, but united by thy Holy Spirit. Uh, to one another. We ask, Lord, that you can enlighten our minds, that you can strengthen us for this week of trials that is ahead. We need you every hour, and we pray for each one searching for truth, that you can guide and lead them into all truth. We pray that you can direct us as we go through these verses, as we continue to try to understand the line of the judges particularly um, here with Abimelech, and help us to, to sort through these things clearly and understandably. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. Um, so where we left off, we were... Uh, particularly looking at um, well, we were dealing with Jotham and him fleeing away, and then we started with the downfall of Abimelech. So we're a bit further here. Than... Now we had we had spent some time looking. Um, on Thursday at the chronology of November 9th as well. So um, here in the downfall fall of Abimelech, we were dealing with uh, Ebed and Gaal. And um, so I think if we were at, or, yeah, so that's going to be Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brother. That's where we sort of left off. We just kind of started on there. Now, um, we had, so I, I guess if we're going to sort of review this, just for people who are watching, trying to remember, that we took Abimelech as being a message that it has inherited um, elements of this strange woman, his mother, right? And, and this is going to be symbolic of a method of study, understanding the Bible. And, and this is a carryover from uh, the methods of Parminder. Right, so Abimelech's message is infected with this spirit. Now, we also have the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem represents a message um, that because Shechem refers to this covenant, so these this is basically a false covenant. So when an evil spirit comes out of Abimelech, right? So God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Uh, this is going to be these messages, um, basically attacking each other. That is the message of Abimelech, which we take. Uh, as partly related to uh, the conclusions that have been drawn regarding Trump and also the pandemic. So the men of Shechem, um, they're going to turn against this message. But that is the message itself. Now, of course, people are attached to the message. But there's a message from the men of Shechem. And these are people that, uh, this, that has to do with the covenant, this false covenant. Now, when, when we think about uh, Parminder's, so let's just go back to Parminder a bit. What was it about Parminder? What was the main, uh, if we're going to talk about Parminder, what symbol would we attach to a covenant, a false covenant that Parminder had? Because they were organizing. And, and what were they doing? What was, what was part of the whole thing of this organization tied up in? 
What about the baptism? Is baptism a sign of a covenant? Yes, it is. So Parminder began this baptism. Now, the reason that they began baptizing people was um, many of the people in who had been coming into this message, at least this is what was told us in Africa, uh, wanted to be baptized. That is, some of them weren't actually baptized as Adventists yet. So they were gaining converts in Africa, uh, but they needed to baptize them, and they didn't have any baptismal vows, right? So Parminder was um, instructed, I guess you might, you might say. He was told by Jeff, you know, you need to get some baptismal vows. And so Parminder produced these ba baptismal vows. And um, there was problems with these vows. Uh, one is they weren't really vows. They were more a doctrinal, um, they would be more like the fundamental beliefs. So for instance, in the Adventist church, we have whatever, however many fundamental beliefs it is now. Um, but those are different than baptismal vows, right? Correct. Because yeah. when I was baptized, I think there was 13 baptismal vows, but we had 27 fundamental beliefs, as they were called. So well, the baptismal vows did not include all of the beliefs, because these are vows, right? Um, so, but Parminder created these, basically a statement of beliefs that they call baptismal vows, and there was lots of errors in those baptismal vows, but more particularly the one that bothered me was the one dealing with the nature of Christ. That Christ came in a fallen human body, but not in a fallen human nature. So I don't know how many people studied those, those vows. And I pointed this out uh, to both Jeff and Parminder. And, and Jeff agreed that it needed to be changed. Uh, and Parminder admitted it was wrong, but he didn't change it. So, um, but anyway, would that have anything to do, this covenant of baptism, to deal with a symbol for the men of Shechem? That, that those beliefs of Parminder uh, still exist within the movement? Or am I going down the wrong path here? I think if we take a look at the... Um... The balance of this, I mean, the the point that you're making, especially about this with the nature of Christ, is something that I think we're giving clear counsel on, that we're not to, to step on that kind of ground. Uh, what do you mean, on the nature of Christ, not to step on that ground? Well, I know the nature of the Godhead, but I don't okay. know the nature of Christ. But Christ is part Christ. of the Godhead. Yeah, but I mean, when it comes to his human nature, Ellen White's quite clear about Christ's human nature. He came, he took on all of human nature after it had been, what was it, 4,000 years of sin? Yeah. 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 So he took our nature after it had, you know, man had fallen 4,000 years. So right. he took upon himself uh, his divine nature. Uh, took upon himself human nature. I mean, there's a mystery there that we can't uh, understand. We can't try to explain it, but we need to know that he's fully God and fully man, that he's not, you know, some inferior God, and he's not some kind of Superman. He's, he's God just as much as the Father is God, and he's man just as much as you and I are man. The thing is, he didn't sin. Right. So the nature right. of Christ is a fundamental belief. Uh, without that understanding of the nature of Christ, you can't really understand righteousness by faith. And, and when people depart from an understanding of the nature of Christ, then they end up with false ideas of righteousness by faith. Either they go into holy flesh if they believe in overcoming sin so that we get some kind of new nature and our fleshly nature is removed so that we don't sin, or they limit man's ability to overcome sin in some way so that we continue sinning until Jesus comes back. So you have these two different uh, 
errors that come from not understanding Christ's human nature. So we can understand Christ's human nature, that it's fully man. To understand his divine nature and the mystery of the incarnation, those things are not for us to understand. But the point here having to do with um, the men of Shechem, that this is a false covenant based upon a false understanding of truth. Would we agree with that part? Yes. Okay. So, um, so these men of Shechem set liars in wait, that is, um, set up an ambush uh, for this message of Abimelech, right? So this is Abimelech, the men of Shechem is a message that's going to turn against uh, this Trump prediction and uh, the pandemic prediction. And they robbed all that came along that way by them, and it was told of Abimelech. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of the Shechem put their cons confidence in him. So we just said the Gaal is the son of a servant, because uh, Ebed means a servant, and Gaal means basically uh, disgust. And it's a onomatopoeic sort of word. It's sort of what you would express if you were to gag, right? So it's more like a gag than anything, uh, the name. So, so that's where we left uh, off on Thursday. And we had come back to this after looking at uh, dealing with November 24th. So we spend a lot of time on that, looking at these charts, and also Stephen's charts dealing with, with um, uh, 31 uh, times 7 and et cetera, 191 BC, all those things. So we've looked at a bunch of things, and now we're coming back to, to study this. And we have this period of three years, which we're saying is from – uh, 2021 from December 25th to uh, January 11th, 2023. So we got this period of three years. We tied it in with the three days. So now, how do we take Gaal, the son of Ebed? What kind of message is this? Brother Theodore? Yeah. Before you get too far in this, I need to ask you a question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Jesus was fully human and fully divine, right? Yeah. His boat. So that means he would have 46 chromosomes, right? Yeah, he's got the same number of chromosomes as any human being. Why? So he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have 23. He would have 46, right? Yeah. Well, you couldn't actually function with 23. Okay. I mean, you can't you can't have half half a, a genome. Well, I heard somebody in this movement say that he had twenty. He could, he he had twenty three chromosomes. And what did they base that on? I ain't figured it out yet, but okay. I knew I knew I knew that he was it. In order to be fully human, you had to have forty six chromosomes. In order to Ron Wyatt. Ron Wyatt? Oh, yeah. okay, because of that. That's uh, where they based it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and Ron Wyatt was just a charlatan, so um, unfortunately also an Adventist, but um, he, he just liked the attention. So, yeah, so okay. I think it has something to do with the blood that he supposedly found on the ark that had dripped down from... From okay, God. yeah, that's right, because I, I had forgot about, I just, when you started talking about the nature of Christ and the and the divine, divine divinity and divine, let me get this right, the nature of Christ and then the human part of it, when you mentioned that, I, I, I realized that, you know, 
he had to have 46, but I heard somebody, like I said, I heard somebody in this movement say 23, but I just, I just find that kind of appalling. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah, the people come up with all kinds of theories and especially people like Ron Wyatt. So, I mean, I used to follow Ron Wyatt back in the nineties, you know, so so I, be, I became disillusioned with him pretty early on. Um, but it, it took a while. I mean, I had to read quite a bit of his material before I started realizing it was it contradicted the scriptures. Uh, then later on, I found more about him. But anyway, so well, I didn't uh, mean to, I didn't mean to um, that's okay. jar you off course. But. Yeah, well, yeah. So what we see here, though, is Gaal, the son of Ebed. So it's it's somebody that it's a message of disgust, right? That is going to um, turn against uh, Abimelech, right? That's how we would see it. Now, when it says it's the son of a servant, would this be people who have just blindly followed? the message, who, who turn against it with disgust later on. Is that what it's describing? Not, not sure that's exactly what it's discussing. Yeah. I don't have any theories to, for anything else. It sounds pretty good, though. Well, yeah, it's just, it's, but, but we know that they're going to turn against this message of Abimelech at some point. We don't know exactly when or how. We, we, we think it might happen in January. Um, and, we, and we don't know also what else is involved. So, um, because it's not just about the Trump prediction, there's also the pandemic. Now, one of the things uh, dealing with the pandemic, which, um, I mean, we know as time has gone on, um, a lot of things that people have have said um, that, you know, claims we made, for instance, regarding uh, the e efficacy of the. That they haven't been as effective as they originally claimed, either in um, reducing deaths or or even uh, spreading infections. So. I mean, there's a debate over this. So whether what's exactly the truth, you know, it'll probably take a lot of years for this all to be, uh, to come out mostly after the people who were involved are, are past. So, you know, you would, you would think, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we'd have a much different perspective than what's presently being promoted, right? So, uh, so over time, you would think that there would be a more objective look at this, but you know, it depends on what happens in the world, of course. Um, but definitely, things are coming out regarding the, the pandemic that uh, many people warned about at the beginning, right? So, um, and and also particularly the damage that you get from uh, uh, all of the restrictions. So the mask wearing, what kind of effects that has had. The social distancing, all of these things have affected uh, the way that other viruses have developed as well. So, you know, if you're social distancing and you're cleaning your hands and you're wearing masks and not that they do much good, but, um, you know, it's going to make it much more difficult for some viruses to spread. And those viruses don't disappear. What happens is uh, they become... The, the the ones that are able to spread, spread, and the ones that are able to spread are actually a little more infectious than the ones that weren't able to spread. Does that make sense to people? How I said that? You know, in, in a sense, it's like, it's like distorting the market, right? It's like when the government set, sets uh, um, um, interest rates. It distorts the market. And, and that's kind of what happens with 
with social distancing and all these uh, uh, restrictions, it, it distorts the environment in which viruses and, uh, normally spread, right? So you're not just going to affect um, the coronavirus, uh, like COVID particularly, but all kinds of coronaviruses, all kinds of flu viruses, all kinds of cold viruses, all of those are affected uh, in those types of situations. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, to me. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so you distort the environment and you have unforeseen circumstances um, like now that the restrictions are, are lifted, I mean, everybody's getting sick. I mean, the schools are, you know, half the students are there, uh, you know, once winter hit here uh, because everybody's getting sick. One is they haven't been uh, exposed to viruses for a couple of years, so their immune systems are down. But also the viruses themselves have have um, changed, right? The ones that that have survived are the ones that are more contagious. So, yeah. so you isolation have... really causes a lot more problems. Look at the uh, the Mayans. You know when the conquistadors came in, so they yeah. died of all kinds of uh, of issues that were all basically medical related. That uh, these people were carrying. Yeah. And, and of so course, isolation causes its own problems. Right. So, so, you know, you're trying to stop one thing, but you don't see the consequences of, of your actions. And this, this happens in environmentalism all the time. Um, you know, which I'm really familiar with is, uh, uh, you know, parks Canada and what it does in trying to save species and they end up causing more damage in their actions to save species than they would have if they just left things alone, right? So uh, so they have these unforeseen circumstances by their actions. And so this happens all the time. Now, so I bring that up in the sense that, um, uh, you know, we kind of went off track a little bit there. But what, what, we, what we see is that um, with, with the pandemic, and with uh, Trump, which are really these two main elements of these predictions, what's going to happen with the Sunday law in regarding the pandemic. Um, we see that a lot of this was true. So there was a lot of deception going on, but also a lot of misinformation on the other side of things. So there's um, people getting caught up in these sort of uh, speculative and emotional uh, sort of problems, knowing that um, there is definitely problems, but that's not to be our focus, right? Because the Sunday law is about the Sunday, right? And so we know that this pandemic was a type of the Sunday law, but it's not the Sunday law. And so how this is going to unfold, how this understanding that happens within the movement regarding how we've been misled um, and mostly by following the methods and understanding of the world, right? So we would have to know that this movement has been misled. It has been deceived, but it's been deceived internally that, that has come to this movement internally. And so when that is realized, we can see that Gaal, the son of a servant, right, this disgust, um, and, and the men of Shechem, this other message, is going to put their confidence in him. So what this means particularly, I don't know. I would think that it's going to be people who end up turning against the message completely, that it is going to be a message against the movement but that's just my my impression from what i read here so do people understand what i'm saying so i'm saying that here we have this movement and we have people that have followed abimelech this message and they're going to turn against the entire message completely 
or or would we interpret this some other way? Well, okay, let's let's look at this in a different manner. Okay. We know that Abimelech, we're we're accepting Abimelech as a message, mm -hmm. but is a is is Abimelech a righteous message? No. So would these Gaul son of Ebed, the servant that loathes the message? Yeah. Would they be those that turn against the message of Parmender and Tess? Well, yes, because that's part of what it is. Um, so, well, the, the question is, I mean, they're turning against some message. Right. Agreed. Right? And, and the message here is that they're going to, they're going to, um, that is the men of Shechem, this other message that had, that was part of that covenant, right? That false covenant. Correct. They're going to put their confidence in this new message now. Right. So Abimelech had a message that was a message. And now there's this new message and this new message is one of disgust. Right. It's a repulsive message. It's a rejection of what had happened. They in they've been deceived and they recognize this. Right. So the men who have made this false covenant, they put their confidence in this new message. Right. Or this message of the false covenant. Now, I, I don't see that Gaal, the son of Eba, that his message is any better. I mean, they may turn, you know, because what you're saying is they turn against Parminder. But I don't see here, um, as we go on in this story, that this is, in, in how I read it, um, any better to me it seems like to be just a rejection of the whole message altogether that is this is what's happening internally within that movement within that message and and i would see this as as a loss of many people who accept this message because we saw something similar in a sense with july 18th i mean people turned against the message but people tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Well, the, the point, going back to, to several things that Elder Jeff had had to say, mm -hmm. when the message that was promoted by Parminder and Tess began to take great hold, mm -hmm. the ones that were most impacted by it were those that were younger and that were not that committed to truly studying these things out for themselves. They were, they were following a leader. Mm -hmm. Now, here again, we're not trying to put a person to it, but I'm having to use a person as an example, as a message. Mm -hmm. Because the messages that Parminder and Tess were choosing were more of a, a worldly type of message mm -hmm. than they were a message based upon scripture and understanding of scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... The, the social justice type of message is what took hold and took hold quickly. Right. Now, there was a whole group of people, though, that didn't accept that. So, right. Um, and people who felt, uh, in some ways, I mean, what I saw was sort of a, a type of, for lack of a better word, a gloating over the fact that they weren't deceived by Parminder's message because they were they were conservatives and they didn't buy into this wokeism, right? Right. 
but yet they were still infected with the same spirit. They just they just didn't see it. Right. So it's right. easy to see, you know, we don't agree with Parminder, but they were just as political, just in the other direction. And, and in a sense, just as worldly. Just in the different direction. So they also had not really studied. And they also were followers. Right. So they followed Jeff instead of Parminder. You just had different people following different leaders. But really, there still wasn't much difference between the two. That is, when it came down to understanding the message, the December uh, 6th, 2020 declaration made the same arguments as Parminder against July 18th. So, so they were of the same spirit, but also of the same understanding when it came to the elements of truth that mattered, that we were being tested by. Right? Agreed. Okay. So, so when we have this marriage, uh, marriage message of Abimelech, Abimelech still has that same, the same basic underlying principles as Parminder's message. It's just manifest in a different way. That's the way that I would look at it. And then you have the men of Shechem. So again, this is a message, but people are attached to the message. And this is a false covenant. That is, I would say that to some degree, if we're going to look at, at what it is, it has to do with this covenant, this idea of, and I'm using here the baptism as a symbol. That is, we're attached to doctrines or teachings that are after the commandments of men. We haven't we haven't continued using Miller's rules. We're trusting in something else. And so so people accept the message of Abimelech because they have accepted the message of Parminder at its root. Even though externally they they have rejected Parminder's message, they're still operating with the same premises. Right? They still have a false covenant. Now, Gaal, he's going to um, he's going to go over to the men of Shechem, and they're going to put their confidence in him. So they still have this false covenant. They're not converted here just because they turn against Abimelech. Right. Right. But they have a disgust, and and this, of course, is something that happens all the time. Uh, there's other examples of this, but the best example probably is at the end of the world when those that have been deceived turn against the religious leaders who have deceived them. Right? It doesn't save them. Right? They're not going to be converted. Their probations have closed. No, but it's their last final act. Yeah. And so to me, this is just that type of parallel. Where you can see this um, this disgust over being deceived, but they're still going to be the same. They haven't changed. They're, I, still, you, they're still the men of Shechem. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. So, well, well let's let's go on and read some of this here because you know we, we've tried to set it up here um, so that we can understand it, but we might be corrected as we go through this. And they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. So we can see here, they're not, still not followers of God. And they gathered from their vineyards. And so what is their vineyards? Well, that's where they produced the doctrine. Okay, right. So they're going to to study however they study and they're going to come up and draw conclusions okay right? but yeah all right when when we're looking at this the the verse itself has the grapes 
yeah in italics so those are added words right yeah because they trod when it says they trod i mean it's obviously the vineyard this would just mean they trod um, on these grapes now um the word there is actually house oh pardon me no i'm looking at the wrong one a uh, tread um to walk to string a bow um so they're going to to tre treads on something and that's going to be of course the grapes so that's why they put the grapes there but but this is um that they're they are studying is the way that i look at it okay now is the is the alternate reading where it says that they made merry the alternate reading would be showing that is songs rather than made merry yeah this is more uh, well it's praise. It could be Mary in the sense of rejoicing. So they're going to rejoice. Okay. Right. And they go into the house of their God. Right. So and that's what was, what was their God? Well, Baal. Baal Bereth. Yeah. Okay. Baal, Baal Bereth. The, yeah. The God of the covenant. Right. So well, they're going, they're going into the house of the or the temple of the god of the covenant mm -hmm. which we've already established was a false covenant to begin with yeah yeah so the, or the lord <clears throat> covenant baal is lord so yeah and they're going to curse abimelech so they're going to turn against this message but they're not going to be any better off so if if we were to look at the verses that the translators had recommend we see we would then be looking at isaiah 16 9 and 10 and jeremiah 25 30 yeah so therefore i will bewail the weeping of jazer the vine of sibma i will water thee with my tears o heshbon and Eliah, el Eliah, for the shouting and for thy summer fruits and for the harvest of thy fallen and gladness is taken away, joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards, there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I've made their vintage shouting to cease. Okay, so they're bringing us to that because of some of the similar sort of words. And the other one was Jeremiah 25. 30. <clears throat> so that's going to be, um, therefore... Prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah, so they're they're dealing with the treading part of it. Um, I don't know how that helps us particularly. Um, because if you're going to say that the grapes, I mean, here it seems to be more God's judgment, um, you know, but. Well, <clears throat> okay. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. Yeah. In that one, I'm talking about the other one, but yeah, treading out no wine in their presses. So if they're treading out no wine, then. Are they producing no doctrine? Yeah, but well, yeah, there's that's the famine of the word of God, if you want to put it that way. So it's a completely different context. The one in Jeremiah is more um, dealing also with the judgment of the wicked. It would align more with what we see in Revelation, but okay. Um, so I'm saying it's not it's not really helping us here. I mean, it's not giving us information that. It's going to help us understand this better other than you know we understand that here um this this is referring to false doctrine so these people are are worshiping in the house of baal bereth and so you know it, it, they're not good they're they're not benefited because they turned against the message of abimelech and that's part of the problem by of being deceived by a false message. Just because you reject it doesn't mean that you're going to end up on the side of truth. 
people can go from one false message to the next. Right, and that, that's the danger that's here when it comes to following man and not following Miller's rules, not following how we are to study God's word, to trust in the conclusions of man and that, that sort of feed our, one is feed our ego to some degree, um, but feed our self-deception, right? Because we want to think of ourselves as better than we are. And when you study the truth, uh, you're convicted of your sins. You're not, you're not going to be exalting over others who are deceived. And often that's what happens. And I'm going back to, you know, when Parminder's group left, uh, pretty much I, I was very unhappy with the sort of talk that, that we had um, that even showed up on the videos from the School of the Prophets. You know, basically mocking Parminder and sort of exalting that we weren't deceived. You know, other people were deceived, marking, mocking those that were deceived. And I didn't think that was appropriate. One is because it's, it, it's not that simple, right? I mean, we should be thankful that we weren't deceived. But uh, there, there was a lot of things going on that I, I wasn't happy with in the attitudes of people. And, and it showed up in the December 6th, 2020 declaration. So, so we saw the same spirit. And, and this spirit is going to be manifested again because it already exists. It's the same spirit that does the gossip and the rumors and the character assassination. It's just going to be manifested internally amongst people who right now are, you, you know, working together, believe the same things, but they're going to turn against each other. Now, going to turn against the when, when we're looking at this first with Isaiah 16, 9. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I will be I will bewail with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Eliah. Yeah. Now, wasn't Heshbon like a capital city of the Amorites? Wasn't that one of the cities that Moses overthrew? Yeah, well, it sounds familiar. I'm not 100% certain what Heshbon was. Um, so Heshbon's first mentioned in Numbers 21-25. Yeah, right. it's, yeah, it's the city of the Amorites. Yeah. yeah so the royal city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites. Mm -hmm. So... So that, and then this Elia, I mean, the meaning of that, of that word is that God has ascended. Okay. Well, that, so, that's, that's kind of my point, is that Isaiah 16 is talking about a different context. It's not, it's not in the same place, if we're, if we're going to study that. Um, it's not giving us information about this story. That's, you know, I mean, it can give us information about treading out grapes and why they would translate that as trod the grapes. But um, but I, I mean, I guess I'm looking at this <clears throat> as in why would why would those tears then water the situations of the of those that were pagan? It's like no. Yeah, I I just I, I'm just I'm I'm trying to puzzle this out. Okay. Yeah. I just think 
I wouldn't go in that direction. I just don't okay. think it's going to be helpful in this study here. Um, it's it's not directly relating to what we're studying, even though some of the words are. Okay. But. Okay. All right. So then we're going to have all the son of Ebed say, who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jeroboam, Gideon, and Zebul, his officer, serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem? For why should we serve him? Um, so what is Gaal saying here? Is he not questioning the legitimacy of Abimelech? Yeah. And he's comparing the legitimacy of Abimelech to Hamor. The father of Shechem. The, the party that established, yeah, that established Shechem because right. his son was named Shechem. Right. So, so when he's talking to the men of Shechem, He's not just attacking Abimelech here. He's actually ta attacking Shechem himself. Right. right? Now Shechem, uh, now Hamor, the son of Shechem, or the father of Shechem, right? So Hamor um, is, uh, uh, Genesis 34.2. That means a he ass. And, yeah, so the first is, yeah, so it's going to be, um, well, we're first going to have um, Hamor mentioned in Genesis 33, 19, right? So there, um, so this is going to be that situation where Jacob meets Esau, right? And he's going to want to pass over this, this land, right? We looked at this before. Um, and, and what happens? Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant. Um, and I will lead thee on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children are able to endure until I come into the Lord, unto my Lord, unto seer. And Esau said, let me now leave with thee uh, some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way into Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him in a house and made booths for his cattle, and therefore the name of the place is called Succoth, or booths. And Jacob came to Shalem, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for an hundred pieces of money, and he erected there an altar and called it El Eloah Israel. Um, so that's where we're first going to have Hamor. Or the children of Hamor, Shechem's father. So that's that's the first time. Now you had the other one was Genesis. 34.2. Yeah. So that's the next time he's mentioned. And that's still. That has to do with uh, the Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamor, saying, get me this damsel to wife. All right. So we know that story. Um. So this is the origins of um, of the city of Shechem, right? Just who Shechem is. That's all connected to the city of Shechem, to the men of Shechem, right? Right. So, uh, you know, we could probably spend a bit more time on that, I guess. Um, but it's all going to be in Genesis 34. It's going to be mentioned um, that the 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 bones of Joseph in Joshua 24, 32, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, bury they in Shechem, right? And then we have Shechem in Judges 9, 28. 
or Hamor mentioned in 928, and Hamor is going to be mentioned there. So, um, so if we go back to this this reference, then, so who is Shechem that we should serve him in Judges 928? Um, So it says, so I'm trying to understand what he's saying. Is not he the son of Jeroboam or Gideon, right? Right. Talking about Abimelech and Zebel, his offer, serve the men of Hamor, uh, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? So I, I don't still don't quite understand this sentence or this, this verse, what, it, what he's exactly saying. So the man of, of loathing, yeah, the son of the God that has gone up. No, excuse me, of Ebed. Son of the Ebed, yeah. Son of the servant. Who is it? Okay. So who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? So there he the two are being compared. Right. So then the next portion said, is he not the son of Jerubal? Is he not Gideon's progeny? Right. And that he's talking there about Abimelech, of course. Correct. And then he's saying, and Zebul, his offer, his officer. Right. So Zebul is um, the officer. Um, so I'm not sure particularly because that's the first time he's mentioned. Um so I'm not sure what this reference is about. I mean, Zebul means um, dwelling. Okay. So that's. So Zebul means dwelling. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now he's asking. Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. For why should we serve him? Yeah, so it could be that he's saying you need to serve Hamor, the father of, of Shechem. But I, I, that's, I, I still find this sentence just rather confusing because of the way it's constructed. Yeah, the, the structure is, is odd. Yeah, I mean, if I look at um, uh, just some other versions on how they try to put this. This is the English Standard Version. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who's Abimelech and who are we of Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam and is not Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? And that would sort of make a bit more sense. Um, they're trying to make sense out of this, this sentence. So the idea... Um, is not so much um, it, it's it's why why should the men of Shechem basically serve Abimelech? Well, <clears throat> we're given the same the same type of situation with First Samuel twenty five ten. Okay, so and Nabal answered David's servants and said, "Who is David and who is the son of Jesse?" There be many servants now nowadays that break away every man from his master. So Nabal here is questioning David's lineage and David's validity. Right. So the idea there is, you know, who are we to, to serve? Like, I mean, we're not going to serve Abimelech because... He's just a son of Gideon, is the argument that, that Gaal is making. Right. Right. So, and then, yeah. And then also 1 Kings 12, 16. Okay. 1 Kings 12, 16. Yeah, so that's going to be. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, 
The people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house. Uh, David, see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. So what would you gather from that? Well, <clears throat> here Israel is seeing that the king is not listening to them. So the people answered the king saying, what portion have we in David? So the story that, that we've got here is that of Rehoboam. When, when he was giving these, these commands and it caused the dividing of the kingdom. So in the message that we've been dealing with, the message that Abimelech had, has been giving has been a very much dividing message. We've been proving that as we've been taking this step by step. Yes. So, and, and that's, that's kind of the point. Uh, I mean, in all of this, where do our loyalties lie? Right. And, and in this movement, see, the problem that I had with um, uh, Colin's use of the Trump prediction is is on the one hand you're trying to say well we're 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 supporting what Jeff has said, right? Because right. Jeff says Trump is the last president, and now we have Biden, but we need Trump as the last president. Even though Colin accepted that that, that uh, the globalists took over the United States on January 6, twenty twenty one, which means that Trump is the last president of the United States. Right, because that becomes a marker. That becomes this separation. Um, we could say that that's the fall of that horn in our line. Right, the Republican horn falls. But then we're taking uh, messages regarding um, the King of the North and the King of the South. Right. So the idea then is that since the King of the South won on January sixth. 2021 and we know that 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 must be raffia then november 8th 2022 we're going to have paneum right that's basically the argument that colin made correct yeah okay so now i would agree that you you can do that as far as raffia is concerned and you might even be able to take a paneum, but the question is, what line are you in? We know that that raffia is not the raffia that we've been looking for ultimately. It becomes a symbol. So we're in this symbolic line. And, you know, we don't need Trump, even in that whole scenario, you don't need Trump to become president. But also there's just things that are mixed together from Parminder's understanding that had misled us that we're now trying to fulfill. So we may be, you know, Abimelech, a message that's, that's associated with, with, with the message of July 18th in that it's a descendant of Gideon, right? But it's illegitimate in that it has destroyed the prophetic foundation of the 70 weeks symbolically and has not, but it did not destroy um, Jotham, who is the 70th week. And so, so when we see this, when we, when we look at what's happening, this divisive message, it, it wants to claim legitimacy. Now, the thing is, Gaal, the son of Ebed, I mean, he's going to say, you know, you should never even have, have followed any of that because it was all legitimate, illegitimate, because it came from Gideon, the message of July 18th. So this would have to be an outright rejection 
not just of the message of Abimelech, not just the message of Trump and the pandemic, but basically of the whole message of July 18th that's going to happen in this movement. Right? But they're going to want to go to this covenant, this false covenant. And in some ways, I think that this false covenant leads back to the Adventist church. I think I can see that. Yeah. And, and then we've seen this already, that people go back to the Adventist church. They just, they eventually reject this whole message. And there are people who have already rejected pretty much the whole message. Um, though they, they were still clinging on to parts of it, but usually for, for different reasons. It is, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but because they have themselves have a message and and they want that message to be heard. So they're not really interested in in what Colin's been teaching or what odilio has been teaching. They have another agenda. And so so they will turn against this message and the people who have been deceived will follow them. So. So this Gaal is a message, but that Gaal has been waiting in the wings, so to speak, for a while. In a way, would you say that he was biding his time? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. And clever. Yeah, so he says here, and would God, this people, were under my hand, then would I remove Abimelech? And he said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. Who does that remind us of? Um, well, I don't know. Um, who, what about Absalom? Oh, okay, Absalom. Yeah, because didn't in this situation in First Samuel fifteen four, or Second Samuel fifteen four, Absalom said, "Moreover, oh that I were made judge in the land, that every mm -hmm. man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice." Yeah, yeah, I was yeah that part come were under my hand. Yeah, I was thinking about the increase of thine army, and I could think. Of, uh, I was looking at the last part of that verse. Um, so here, though, we have Abimelech it is going to, to fight against this, right? So there's this message of Abimelech is not going to uh, give up easily, right? No. So increase thine army and come out, right? So there's going to be a conflict within this alliance between the men of Shechem and Abimelech. And then we're going to have Zebul, the ruler of the city, who hears the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his anger is kindled. So we had looked at this before, but not as in much detail as we are now. So, uh, so with uh, Zebul, um, this is going to be uh, exalted. He's the ruler of the city, and he hears the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, right? And he sent messengers unto Abimelech privily or privately, saying, Behold, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brethren be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. Now, what's the reason? Why is he doing this? So he is supporting Abimelech. Right. That's what it is, right? No. Okay, so when we read this, the the alternate Hebrew privily, I would agree, would mean privately. Yeah. Is that what that word, that Hebrew word actually means? Um, well, it means through deceit. Right, craftily. Yeah, more craftily than privately. But yeah, so it's something that he's doing secretly. 
um, in the sense that he's he's not letting it be known exactly what he's doing for a reason, for deceitful purposes. So Zebel sends messengers deceitfully to Abimelech. Yeah. Saying, behold, Gaul, the son of Ebed and his brethren become to Shechem and behold, they fortify the city against you. Mm -hmm. What does it mean that they're fortifying the city against Abimelech? Well, they're protecting uh, the city from Abimelech. So they're preparing for a battle. They know that Abimelech is, is coming. Right. Yeah. Because the city is already going to have its own walls. Right. So what Zebel is saying that the son of Ebed and his brethren are fortifying the city. Mm -hmm. What do you build additional walls? I mean, is there is there something in a well I don't know here? But, but you would get um you know, you would get your army gathered around. You might um, lock up some things that need to be locked up to make it less easily accessible. Um, and it also refers to basically uh, uh, putting people into, because the word means to cramp, that is to confine. So, so they're going to enclose the city. So the following verses... Zebel is telling Abimelech, now therefore up by night, thou mm -hmm. and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. Yeah. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early and set upon the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, thou mm -hmm. mayest do to them as thine hand shall find or as thou shalt find occasion. Yeah. So, Zebel is giving a private, very, is it a, a deceitful message then to Abimelech? Well, you're saying, is he trying to deceive Abimelech? Yes. Yeah, so, well, we talked about this before when we studied it. Um, so it says, Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gaal saw the people... He said to Zebel, Behold, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebel said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. And Gahal spoke again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land, and another company come along by the plain of Meonium. And then said Zebel unto him, Where is now thy mouth, and wherewith thou saidst, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. Okay. Now, right? so so it appears that Zebel is uh, more on the side of Abimelech, right? Right. In this case, but if if we step back to this at, at Judges nine thirty seven, yeah. And Gaal spoke again and said, "See, there come." people down by the middle of the land and another company come along by the plain of Meonium. But what does the Hebrew read on Meonium? Well, that means uh, the cloud, the plain of the cloud means to cover, um, to cloud over. Okay, now it's interesting. To practice magic, right? So that, but that's in another context or usage. Okay. Now the, the translators had it as being the regarders of the times. Yeah. Soothsayer, sorcerer, enchanter. Okay. 
And here again, the translators then give reference back to Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 14. Mm -hmm. So the soothsayers were people that were not supposed to continue to exist in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Because in this portion of Deuteronomy, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Mm -hmm. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations, which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. So, Zebel is showing his colors that he is standing more with Abimelech, and he's challenging Gaal, where now is thy mouth? Wherewith thou saidest, who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. And then it says, and Gaal went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. Right? Yep. So the message of Gaul stands up against the message of Abimelech and neither message is right. Right. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many were overthrown and wounded, even unto the entering of the gate. What do we take with this? Well, um... I mean, so, so Gaal is going to be, um, the, like, nobody really wins this war, this right. battle, right? So Gaal in, in verse 41, and Bimelech dwelt in Aruma, and Zebal thrust out Gaal and his brethren, that they should not dwell in Shechem. So neither one defeats the other. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a draw. Uh, Abimelech doesn't end up uh, living in Shechem. Gaal, neither does Gaal. Um, at this point of, of what has happened. So whether this is what point this is or where we would put this on a line yet, I don't know, because it's still future. But it does show us something about what's going to happen in the movement. And then in verse 42, and it came to pass on the morrow um, that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech and he took the people and divided them into three companies. And they laid wait in the field and looked and behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. And Abimelech and the company that were with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and slew the people that were therein and beat down the city, and so it was salt. And when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that they entered into the hold of the house of the god Bereth, or that's Bereth, Baal Bereth, right? And was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together, and Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him, and Abimelech took 
an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, what ye have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow and followed Abimelech and put them to the hold and set the hold on fire upon them so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died. Also about a thousand men and women. Then went Abimelech to Thebes and he camped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city and thither fled all the men and women and all they of the city and shut it to them and got up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of, of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all, and all to break his skull, right? So we're going to know that he's going to end up this whole situation. He called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, draw thy sword and slay me that men may say not of me. A woman slew him, and his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. And God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his 70 brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them that came, upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbaal. So, so there's a lot happening here. I mean, Abimelech is a message. Gaal is going to come against Abimelech. The men of Shechem with this leader of the city. Um, leader of the city is on the side of Abimelech. So he's also deceitful, right? Shechem ends up being destroyed. And the men of Shechem... Uh, you have them being burnt, but then you have these other people in the tower, and this is in the city of Thebes, and Thebes is uh, means conspicuous, a town near Shechem. <coughs> Comes from a word meaning to bleach, that is uh, usually cotton or fine linen. So out of all this, I mean, we're going to have uh, Thebes as the only place where it's going to be the place where Abimelech is killed. And there is a strong tower there within that city. So we would need to figure out what that is particularly. But they're going to defeat this message of Abimelech. And, and I would translate it as Tibet's. But it's it, also, it, it's kind of interesting that, that Abimelech destroys the, the base that originally supported him first. Right. What should but, we take from that? Well, I mean, they're going to turn against each other. I mean, because people are attached to this message. So whether they're attached to Gaal or to the message of Abimelech, um, they're going to they're basically destroy each other. But Abimelech is going to be ultimately defeated by a woman who drops a millstone upon him, upon his head, Right from this strong tower, right? Agreed. And and this is in the city of Tibes, which is near Shechem. So, I mean, we don't really know much about the city because um, it occurs in Judges 9.50 twice and 2 Samuel 11.21, where they just refer to this event, right? So, and so we would take this as this strong tower is a message as well. That people flee to.
We also have a shut door that occurs. They go up to the top of this tower. Now this this word millstone uh, Rebek, um, it often means a team, a chariot, or a millstone. That is, it's it's the rider that sits upon top of this mill. So it's the millstone from the top of the mill. Right, as it says, upper millstone is riding on a lower millstone. But it does say riders, troop of riders, horsemen, pair of horsemen, men riding, ass riders, camel riders. So it can be mean all those things as well. But you would not be dropping riders. I mean, the millstone. No, no, no. It's a millstone. I'm just saying as a symbol, it right. has attached to it these other symbols. Right. But yeah, it's a piece of a millstone. It's the upper millstone uh, that's being dropped. Um, and it says a piece of it or a slice. Um, it means cleavage, millstone, cut, slice. It can also just mean millstone. So it probably means just the upper part of the millstone, as I think is what it means. The upper slice of the millstone. So it would be the millstone itself. But that the millstone is being dropped by a woman has a lot of symbolic reference meaning for us. Well, right. So this is representing a church. Right. And and this word, a certain woman, is ichad, which means a united it's, it's the number one, it's the ordinal or first, but it means to bring together as one, right? So a united woman. So it's it's not yochid, which is the, um, also means one. Yochid is um, a singular one where uh, had means a, to be united as one. So this is a church that's united as one. Very much like what the church was after the nine days in the upper room. Yeah. And it's going to be in this strong tower. And the weapon is going to be this millstone. Right. That can have associated with it symbols of Islam. But... The millstone is also a symbol of Father Miller. Okay. Well, that would be interesting too, right? So you got a millstone, Father Miller. So Miller's rules fall upon Abimelech's head. Right. I mean, when we look at it in, in this way, then we have a church that is united, mm -hmm. making use of Miller's rules yeah. to, destroy, to a destroy a false message. Yeah. And the false message seeks to be destroyed by its own servant because it doesn't want to be destroyed by Miller's rules. Yeah. So isn't this kind of committing suicide? Yeah. But he still is slain by a sword, which is the word of God. Right. This message is conquered through Miller's rules, 
but ultimately dies because of God's word. Right. So, I mean, to me, it, it's, I mean, it's things that are still future. And how this unfolds exactly, I don't know. But here again, it's showing us, I mean, if we if we accept these symbols as, as we've just been addressing, mm -hmm. we need to make greater use of Miller's rules and be able to understand more and more how they are going to become of importance within the movement and to us individually. Yeah. Now, when we talk about Miller's rules here, we know that our line upon line that we have drawing things on a line is an extension of Miller's rules, not explicitly stated in Miller's rules, but comes from Miller's rules. Correct. Right. Yeah. Because we just understand Isaiah 28 in, in a way that Miller never saw. Um, but we compare scripture with scripture, but we also draw things on a line. We compare each of these histories with each other. And, and that's how we can, we can construct this story in the way that we've done with Judges, with the book of Judges. Um, so, so this is bringing us to the end of um, that, that in, in 2023, whatever that, that is, wherever we've been brought to the end. But we still have the message of Jotham, which points us to April 5th, 2030. But I don't believe that this happens all in that period. This is something that's going to be happening soon in this movement. You know, and just to say, from what we've seen here, we have the American group and the Canadian group. And we, we, we have our group, too, if you want to put it that way. But, you know, it's um, – but what we see is that we have a group that has been studying using Miller's rules, uh, understanding the lines. And this was set up in contrast with Colin's prediction. So Colin makes this prediction on the 20th day of the ninth month, right? Okay. Presents it. And then on the 21st day of the ninth month um, – Jotham goes to beer, right? Which is what we have done. So this study that we're doing now is Jotham going to beer. During that time, we have the downfall of Abimelech, right? Abimelech is going to reign for three years over Israel. And, and during that time, we see this downfall that occurs. And, and he's going to be paid back for his cruelty towards the, set, the slaying of the 70 sons, right? And, and all is going to come, the spirit of bitterness with this message that is bitter towards Abimelech's message. And we have this conflict. And so this is talking about what's going to happen, which, which I've been saying for, for a long time, because when I see that spirit of criticism, that strife, that's at first aimed at those outside of their ideas, it eventually turns inward. Right. I mean, it's just it's a principle you see all of the time. Right. You know, if we were a group of people who were constantly backbiting each other and talking amongst ourselves and, you know, not agreeing with each other, but not not even always publicly, always in private. You know, we get together in private and we talk about, you know, Dwight or Iran or Ron or whatever, whoever we don't like or Stephen, he's got this idea wrong. And we never, ever come together and talk about it and try to study it out in the spirit of Christ, we eventually will turn against each other because we've already laid uh, those seeds of dissent and disunity. And they're going to grow. They're going to grow and bear fruit, right? Agreed. You, you just can't avoid it. And, and it happens every time. And yet we don't seem to recognize that it happens. You know, we somehow think that we can be critical of others and nothing's going to come of it. 
but it always bears an evil fruit because it's the work of Satan, as we've seen in our other studies. Right? Right. So, so this, is, this is not a pleasant message here about the downfall of Abimelech. And, and with Colin's prediction failing, that's not something to joy over or to exalt. It's quite, quite solemn because the consequences are very, very severe for many people in this movement. But the other thing we know is that Colin's message is based upon truth. That is, he was given specific information, as was Odilio. But that information doesn't lead to the conclusions that he has. You know, he's, he's drawn a, a wrong conclusion. And, and so and it doesn't say anything about these individual people. That is, you know, Abimelech is not Colin, right? or Colin and Adilio tied together. It's just a message. The men of Shechem is a spirit that exists. And it's something that's been inherited from Parminder. So now we, you know, we're going to have to start drawing this on a line a bit more. But, you know, these things that are future, I don't know particularly how to draw them. Um. But I, I believe that there are going to be events that occur over the next couple of months um, that are going to surprise us. That will allow this movement to see that this prediction was false. We don't really know what's going to happen regarding this election, but it's not going to work out the way that Colin thinks. I mean, it already hasn't. But in a sense, the message of Abimelech is increasing its army. And, and that's just going to lead to disaster. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I just find it confusing because you talk of Parman Parmander and Tess, and then you go to Colin and Odilio. Mm -hmm. and so there's just yeah. confusing me. <laughs> okay, so even though people opposed Parmander and Tess, they opposed them for the wrong reasons. I mean, they're correct reasons, but they're not the complete reason. That is, we still have inherited from Parmander and Tess false interpretations of prophecy and are trying to have those fulfilled. But the other thing is just the spirit of, of censuring people, of uh, because Parminder, this was his classic way of doing it. He would talk to your face and say one thing, uh, but he was completely being deceitful. Heidi and I talked to him on a couple of occasions where we asked him flat out what he thought about us and and our role in the movement and he said i'm not worried about you at all but behind the scenes he was doing everything he could to undermine uh me as a person but he wouldn't tell me that, that to my face he wouldn't be open about it and and so things that happened later on we recognized what had actually occurred so so this type of thing has, is exists in this movement right now People are not as open as the day, right? Everything that we do is very open. There's no behind the scenes maneuvering or talking about people. You know, I have no, no judgment about people's character. And if I, had, if I had a feeling about somebody's character, I would never name them and say what I think about a person's character because that's just my opinion. That would be gossip and rumors. That's not the way of Christ. But I just don't have feelings about people. All I know is what the Bible says. Who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost? I don't know. But I do know that we have to study the Bible in a particular way. And we can't take anything personally. 
because that's, you know, that's a mistake that's been made again and again throughout history. Jones and Wagner did that, took things personally, and it undermined their message. So, so that's why we're talking about Parminder and Tess. And, and, and we did this in the study, too. We showed how this connection between Abimelech uh, comes from Parminder and Tess. So, so this has to be ultimately dealt with. The problems that have arisen in this movement way back have still not been addressed. They've only been addressed on the surface, but not the root. So, so thanks for that, Rosanna. Anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that you can be with us throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word tomorrow if it is your will continue to work in our lives in bringing conviction and we pray for those lord who who are struggling to know truth but are uncertain and um, we just pray for each person in this movement that you can speak to them and that they can come to know you fully in jesus name we pray and ask these things amen